Okay, everybody, how you doing? And welcome to episode number 78 of the John Riley Project. It is Saturday, October 5th. We are broadcasting, as we always do, from the city and the country here in Poway, California. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today... Mr. David Leland. How are you? All right. Great to see you. We're going to do a Padres 2019, you know, season in review. Uh, look at the future ahead. I, I, this is going to be a great discussion. Yeah, we got a lot of talk, a lot, a lot to talk about today. Right on. So, um, man, so the season, well, we're in the playoffs now. We've already had the tiebreakers. We're in the, the really the divisional series. This When was the last game? The 30th? The regular season game was, I think, September 30th, wasn't it? 29th. The 29th, the 29th. last Sunday, yeah. Okay, so that was the final game. Did you go to any of the games uh, near the end? Well, the last series was in Arizona. Yes. And But did you go to the series before that against the Dodgers at home? Uh, no, but I did go to the Friday night game uh, against the Diamondbacks, the home series, Okay, great. on the 22nd. Okay. Which has, which is actually a pretty significant game, which we'll get into later. Right on. Okay. So, um, well, let's just uh, kind of break it down. I mean, where do you want to start? All right. So I just want to start by breaking down the season. You know, the 11 5 start, you know, it was fun. You know, we were winning all those close games. But I was like, we got to start playing better. This Because the way we're winning games now, that's not sustainable. And I figured, you know, with the way offense, you know, kind of dies at Petco in April, you know, with the marine layer, especially this year, it was cold and wet, like into June this year. Yeah. And so I figured, you know, the offense will pick up, you know, we can keep winning games. And then the rest of this, after that, it was really a roller coaster for much of the season. You know, we'd go on a, on a losing streak or a cold stretch, and then we'd win a bunch and then lose a bunch. And it was just up and down. And then Tatis got hurt, and then shortly after that, lost a couple series. And then after that, I think the team just completely went in the tank. Oh, September was brutal. I mean, I think I checked at one time. They were like five wins and 15 or 20 losses. Ended at 7 and 20. 7 and 20. Jeez. That's just, that's a, I mean, it's no wonder the Green got ejected. You know, the, the team just went downhill at the very end. I mean, that's the big thing. I think the team quit on Andy Green, and that's why I think he's gone. I mean, you, you heard the first time I was on here, my complaints about Andy Green. So I thought his firing was well warranted. Like I said, I went to that Friday, the 22nd game, mm -hmm. which turned out to be his last game as manager. That was the game where they didn't call Jones out when he started to peel off. So Machado didn't go to tag him. And then Green went out to argue the call, but not really. He didn't even get really argue or get ejected. And then he got booed for that. And then the next, then he brought in a bunch of the bad pitchers who got shell the game got out of reach. And it was just so ugly that we know Ron Fowler that he was... <laughs> The, Head, they, heads are gonna roll. You know, <laughs> they can say all they can say all they want about how um, we want to do this now to get a jump mm -hmm. on like mm -hmm. interviewing candidates or whatever. I think I think they were gonna fire him at the end of the year, but I think that firing him when they did was accelerated by Fowler saying, "Oh, that was such a terrible game. We gotta get him out of here now." <laughs> well, it's like when. Uh when uh, James Shields blew up, right? And then Fowler went off and then, <laughs> then they dealt him, right? You yeah. Know? So unbelievable. So, um, yeah, the, you know, the beginning of the season was so promising. April was like, we were feeling good in April, weren't we? Yeah, we really were. I mean, this was the first year since 2010 that we were 500 at the end of April or better. Yeah, it was amazing. And then, yeah. And then May is when Tatis, you know, strained his hamstring. Yeah. And then May was a little sketchy. Yeah. And June sketchy to begin with, and it had a nice run at the end. Oh, yeah. After the comebacks in Denver, they were on a real nice hot streak there at the end of the month. Yeah. And then finished the All-Star break at 500. We're feeling good, right? Yeah. You know, and, and Tatis was uh, healthy, and he was back. And Or was he back by that time? Yes, he was. Yeah, 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 he was back. Yeah. Um, and then we came out of the All-Star break, and what the hell happened? Well, coming out of the All-Star break, you know, we lost, you know, some close games coming out of the All-Star break. You figure all oh, that happens, you know, we can turn some of those into wins. But, I mean, when you have a bad manager who keeps, like we did, who keeps putting in the wrong guys or writing the wrong lineups and, like, they were losing those close games. I was like, how are we losing these close games? So... I went on Baseball Reference or MLB.com, forget which one it was, and I was looking at the stats of like what Reyes when we still had him and what Hosmer were doing, like different spots in the order. Like he had Hosmer in the two hole and Reyes in the four hole when their stats were, both of them were much better in the opposite place. So it's just like we had a manager out there who was supposed to be this stats guy whose lineups went against stats that a random guy like me can go on Baseball Reference and look up. <laughs> well, do you think... 
Do you think that Green independently made all those choices about the lineup, or do you think Preller and the front office was influencing him? I mean, this could be Preller just throwing Green under the bus after firing him, but Preller did say in his post game, um, not post game, like the post firing Green interviews, that like he had a lot of autonomy over like the lineup and like decisions made in game. Mm-hmm. So it's not like the Mets where the owner flat out says, "Yeah, I told the manager to do that." <laughs> But yeah, that was just I, I I I going into the season, my expectations were modest. I was hoping for a five hundred or close to it, and then we I was feeling good in April, even feeling good at the All Star break, and I think I got my hopes up, and then I got crushed. I mean, Washington and St. Louis, they're both playing in the division series right now. We had a better record than both of them at the end of June, so. Unbelievable. We had reason to be optimistic. Those yeah. two teams are still playing right now in the division series, and we had a better record than both of them at the end of June. And we won the season series against both of them. Amazing. So, um, you know, during the course of the season, you know, there are certain, I guess, inflection points, you know, critical things that happened that swayed the Padres' um, end result. Like, you know, certainly we could look at Tatis when he got hurt and when he came back and then when he got hurt again. But what about some of the trades along the uh, along the the continuum? Do you think the trades destroyed, you know, maybe some of the chemistry on the team or undermined the team in any way? It's a popular thing for people on Twitter to be like, "Oh, look what happened when they trade Reyes. They lost their clubhouse guy, and look, they went in the tank after that." I mean, that's easy to say, but you look at the first. It wasn't a big. It wasn't a very big sample size, but they played. <coughs> excuse me, 10, 11 games after Reyes got traded um, to when Tatis got hurt, and they were a good offensive team in that short span. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I said on the the first time I was on here, why I th- didn't think Reyes was a long-term fit here, so. Yeah, that, I mean, I think looking back at that trade, I, I think that was actually a, a good move by the Padres. They had the log jam in the outfield. You know, Logan Allen was never going to be anything more than a four or five starter, probably, right? And, like, and, yeah. to your, and to your point, Reyes probably, you know, has a lot of flaws, you know, in the overall game that he brings to the table. Um, and then we get a, a really good left-handed hitting, potentially center fielder that really has a tremendous upside. I mean, I don't get the whole the whole scouting the stat line thing of people like, oh, he sucks, that's it. Like, <laughs> I don't get that because, I mean— Tatis's numbers this year are higher than they were in Double A last year, mm-hmm. um, and scouting the stat lines just always kind of dangerous because in the minor leagues you don't know what guys are working on or like how how young they are relative to the rest of the competition. And Termel's pretty young relative to the rest of the Double A competition. He really heated up down the stretch and had a great Texas League playoffs. Mm-hmm. See that Grand Slam he hit that he, won the Texas League championship. I do. I Amarillo. didn't see that one. No. So that must, I mean, so the dude has pop as well. He's yeah. not just a top of the order, you know, speed guy. He's, uh, he's yeah, a- I, I was at the prospect game and um, he was playing in that game and he threw a guy out at second base trying to turn a single into a double. He had a nice single to right field against the lefty. He worked a walk. He was working the counts and all his at bats. And that's the kind of guy we need because, I mean, we got guys who can hit home runs. I mean, we need guys who get on base. Right on. Well, I mean, how many of our home runs were solo home runs? Exactly. Right. right? And Reyes was the king of solo home runs because that guy never got hit with people on base. <laughs> well, he was always pressing. That was the theory, right? That I he, guess. He so either that or he just can't hit with people on base. I don't know. Or he tries to be the hero. Yeah, that's what it seemed. You know, maybe it was a little bit of hero ball with him. Um, but what did you think overall of Machado? The signing of Machado, his performance throughout the year, do you think it's a, it turned out to be as good as we had hoped? I mean, if you just look at the stats, you'd say no. But, I mean, when's the last time we've had a guy, you know, 30-plus home runs playing the defense that he played? And the, an interesting thing that I want to mention about Machado is that a lot of guys don't perform their best in year one of a big contract, you know, new team, you know, new city, new ballpark, new environment, and you got the added pressure. And we really saw that in April with him. But if you look at his stats, May through July, and I don't have him in front of me, but he hit over 290. I believe his on base was near 360. And the slugging percentage was, I believe, over 600 for that three month span from May through July. Right on. And I mean, that's the kind of player we're going to get. And then August and September, I wouldn't read anything into that. Same with Hosmer, which we can get into later. Um, 
those guys just they quit on Andy Green. They don't because it, it was pretty obvious by the interviews with him and Hosmer and even Will Myers that those guys they didn't respect him. And like once Tatis went down, and there was like no reason to really for them to try anymore, I guess, or put or not necessarily not try, but you know, like not go all out, be like if they lose, oh well, whatever, because they just like. We well, quit they, on this guy. They 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 knew it was um, like you know it was developmental, right? It was that devel- developmental shit, you know, that uh, Strom talked about in some of his interviews, yeah. right? So um, it seemed like as we got into August, September, it, you know, the, those big name guys going through the motions a bit. Oh, absolutely. Knowing that. You know, we're just kind of playing out the season. The season is really about letting these young guys produce or at least show themselves. And that created a whole sense of frustration. And yeah, and, and then Green was kind of the the guy that got thrown thrown out for that, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I think they legitimately just quit on Green because you see these other teams that were like out of it. They were still playing hard. Like Kansas City lost over 100 games. They were still playing hard, battling tough with Oakland in the last week of the season mm-hmm. or last two weeks, whatever it was. Remember we signed Machado. Remember the whole thing was, this is back in, was it February, March? Yeah, February. The, the Padres are going to have an edge, right? We're going to yeah. play with an edge, like an aggressiveness. And and really, we mostly saw that from Tatis. Um, but when Tatis wasn't there, the Padres were kind of bland in a lot of ways. I mean, you can, the, uh, yeah, I mean, they were bland. I mean, but I think Machado did bring a little bit of an edge. Like, because like I said, until August, you know, until August, like I believe on August 4th, he was hitting like 278 and his OPS was over 850, I believe, on August 4th or whenever that was. And I mean, that's the kind of guy we were expecting, especially after the slow start in April. So, like, I think up until August 4th, he was everything we could have hoped for. And, I mean, he brought a little bit of an edge. I mean, you, you saw the ejection in Colorado. I mean, he was trying to tell these guys, hey, it's okay challenge to question the strike zone if you don't like it. Right. It was just that once Tatis went down, the whole team went in the tank. Yeah. Well, it's going to be so great to have him back next year. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just what a special player. Now, let me – here's a question for you with Tatis. Do you think if he was – if he was healthy the entire year, would he have been the rookie of the year, knowing what Pete Alonso actually ended up producing? I'm going to say no, just because, I mean, we know baseball writers. We know the East Coast bias. They're not going to vote for a guy in Little San Diego over a New York kid <laughs> who had 53 home runs. Right. I mean, that's just that sucks, but that's just the reality of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it, just, it, it was so beautiful when Tatis was producing as a rookie. I just felt like we, we've never had that in San Diego in so long. It's been forever. To have an elite prospect and to say he's on our team. You know, it just felt so good because it's usually we always have the the scrubs, the 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 you know, the the rule fives, the the guys that are four four A players, right? Oh, right. we de- we've dealt with that for so long. So I mean, uh, even not just Atis, but now it's finally nice to have real prospects like Mejia played well after he came back up. In June, I mean, Urias didn't hasn't played like we want to, at least not yet. But at least he was a legit prospect. Mm-hmm. Well, and but, of course, you got Paddock on the pitching side. Oh, God, I love that guy. Me too. Yeah, he is just the whole notion of believing in yourself. He is fantastic. Um, you know, and he had you know he learned a lot. You know, he was a, he was throwing, and then he learned to pitch, and he made that adjustment, and he was even better at the end. So what a guy! I know. I mean, he. He would have shattered this the single season record for most strikeouts by a rookie pitcher, if not for the innings limit. I mean, he was only three short. Really? Yeah. Only three? Mm-hmm. Who holds who holds the record, you know? Uh I don't. No. But he was only three short. Wow. What a special guy. I don't yeah. think we've had a pitcher with the upside of Paddock since Jake Peavy, really. Yeah, I think that's fair. That's a good you assessment. You can say Latos, but Latos was pretty much a head case, and yeah, he was dealt after three years because the team knew pretty much knew he was a head case. Yeah, he was good, but he wasn't PV good. No, you know, well, I, from May through August that one year in 2010, he was, but other than that, no. Is he still playing ball? No, he's, yeah, that guy's a knucklehead. I mean, who wants that guy? I mean, after we traded him, he bashed us. After Cincinnati traded him to Miami, he bashed them. Right. Which and Jay Bruce had to come out and say none of that's true. That guy's full <laughs> of nonsense. So he he's been out of the game for at least a year, right? Yeah. And then when he got traded to Miami, um, trade, then when Miami traded him to the Dodgers, he said bad things about Miami. And then the, he was only with the Dodgers a month. They DFA'd him because he was a disaster. He criticized them too. The guy just. 
The guy w- w- just blasted every team he left. That guy was such a head case. Just the classic burning of the bridge, right? You know? Oh. <laughs> so you I wanna... think that guy went to the Dean Spandos, Mark Fabiani school of bridge burning. Mark, Mark Fabiani. Don't bring that guy up. Jeez. Um, you want to break down the roster? You want to go yeah. through it? Yeah. So where do you want to start? Let's start with manager because we got to have a guy to lead these guys. Right. So thankfully, Andy Green's gone. Mm-hmm. You know how I feel about him. We talked about that. <laughs> right. You are not a fan of Andy Green. What well, definitely was not. Right. And um, so you got the big names out there. You know, you got Joe Madden probably going to the Angels with his past connections there. But man, if we could get him in here, that'd be great. I mean, he took a young Tampa Bay team to the World Series, you know, young Chicago team there, broke the curse of the Billy Goat. You know, mm-hmm. he's great with young players, you know, mm-hmm. great with players in general. So if we could get that guy in here, that'd be great, especially because if we're stuck with that Will Myers contract, which we can get into, Myers, Madden got the best out of him in Tampa Bay when yeah, he won he Rookie of the Year. So yeah. that's, a little, that's a little cool thing about Madden if we can end up with him. Right, for sure. Another guy for manager I want to look at, this may be more realistic, is Buck Walter. obviously managed Manny Machado in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. And he turned around a lot of teams um, when he was with New York, he ended the Yankees. He ended their one of their rare playoff droughts. Um, in Arizona, he managed the first three years there, got him to the division title just the second year. Grant, he got help from ownership going all in and getting Randy Johnson, but still. Um, you know, Texas, he got them almost to the playoffs after trading A-Rod. Um, when, you know, with Alfonso Soriano, Mark Teixeira, Hank Blaylock. That was mm-hmm. a tough division back then with um, Ichiro and Edgar Martinez on the Mariners in Seattle. Um, you had Vladimir Guerrero and the recent world champion Angels in Anaheim. And Moneyball with Oakland was still a thing then, too. Yeah. So Well, well Hank Blaylock's Rancher Bernardo, right? Yeah. Yeah, right on. Yeah. And um, then Showalter in Baltimore, you know, he's the only manager to get the Orioles to the playoffs in the 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> The Orioles, man, those guys just are, they're in bad shape right now. <coughs> you know, so, but yeah, Showalter is an intriguing guy. You know, he's a guy that has presence, right? Absolutely. And that's what they're, what AC and all these guys are talking about in these articles. They're talking about a guy who has presence, a guy who comes in and the players are going to respect them. Because the biggest thing with Andy Green, besides his horrible strategy, which I can which I can talk all for days for, but I'm not going to. <laughs> well, you did. You touched on it last time. I did, yes. Yeah, a little bit about his uh, playing the shift and yeah. all that. Anyways, beyond all his strategic failings, the players just simply didn't respect Green, and that's why they quit on him once the season was over. Mm-hmm. So who, what other uh, candidates are they considering for manager? Ron Washington, you know, he took Texas to the World Series two years in mm-hmm. a row. I'd like him. Um Brad Osmus's name has been thrown out there since the Angels let him go. I initially was no, completely against this, and I still don't really want him. But supposedly the players liked him in Anaheim, and he was supposedly a lot better in Anaheim than he was in Detroit. At least mm-hmm. that's what my Angels fan friend told me. So he might be a little more interesting than I thought. I still wouldn't prefer we go that route. <laughs> Mike Socha's been mentioned. I don't want him at all. I mean, you can talk about his wins and losses all you want. That guy... Denver made ALCS with Mike Trout, and he thinks baseball's played in 2002. Hard pass on him. Right, right. His tactics are outdated. He's never adjusted to the modern game. Mm-hmm. Mike Trout was carrying him to mediocrity his last five years there. It's it's amazing that the Angels, with the talent they have, haven't been able to figure it out, you know? Well, how much talent do they really have besides Trout and Otani, if we're being honest here? Yeah, that's a fair point. And Andrews yeah. and Simmons. Yeah, um, so, um, and who else? I mean, I, I know they were considering Carlos Beltran. He, he took his name out of the hat. I don't think he's real interested in managing at all right now. He, two years ago when the Yankees went with, um, Aaron Boone, he was in the running for that, but now he doesn't seem all that interested in managing. I would have liked Moises Alou if he was interested in managing, but he's not. Mm-hmm. Joe Girardi's been thrown out there. I don't think he'd come here. Anyways, because I think he'd either go to Chicago, ooh, the Cubs, because he's an Illinois guy, or um, it, or go back to New York this time with the Mets. But um, I wasn't real thrilled about him anyways, because if you remember, the Yankees didn't bring him back because of he couldn't connect with young players, and we got a really young roster. So, I mean, maybe Girardi learned, and he has won, but still not a guy I would have been thrilled about if he was interested in coming here. Well, he wants to get back into the game. I know yes. he wants to manage a game. I don't think it'll be here, though. 
Okay, and then um, what about Rod Barajas? I mean, people will say, oh, they went one and seven down the stretch. I mean, but like you said, it was developmental. Like, right. They shut down Munoz. Like, we could have won two of those games we lost in Arizona last weekend if we had Munoz. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously didn't have Jose Castillo, which we'll get into. So he, so Bras was working with a severely undermanned team that, and it was eight games anyways. You can't really judge him off that. I like him because the players like him. You know, he's a smart guy, former catcher. You know, he was very successful in El Paso with the Chihuahuas, which has a lot of the players that we have up now. Mm-hmm. So he's interesting. Now, you know, with, with our friends on Padres Twitter, there was one theory that one, I can't remember who posted it, but it was a good one. And he was rooting for the Dodgers to make the World Series and lose for the third consecutive time <laughs> so that they would fire Dave Roberts so the Padres could hire him. Well, I don't think Dave Roberts is a very good manager. Mm-hmm. I mean, he blew the World Series against Houston in 2017. Um, you can question some of the moves he made against Boston last year in the World Series. I think he's just blessed with a great roster. I don't really think he's that great of a manager. Mm -hmm. You know, I I actually ran into him um, sitting down at a, at, where was it? Um, What's the school in Solana Beach? Um, um, It's a Christian school. Santa Fe Christian? Yeah, Santa Fe Christian. And we were there at a Poway High JV game, like in winter ball. And I was, I heard a voice like four or five chairs away from me. And it was Dave Roberts and his son goes to school there. And um, it was, he was a nice guy, you know, so I got a chance just to say hello. Well, that's why our media likes him because our media is soft and they like nice guys. (laughs) I mean, Bud Black could do no wrong when he was the manager because he was a nice guy. Right. He's had a little more success with Colorado. Well, not this year, but the previous last well, couple he, years. Well, he got in the wild card game the last two years. So, mm-hmm. so um, and I, he, I didn't like him when he was our manager here, but he's a heck of a lot better than Andy Green. Yeah, it's interesting looking back on that. Yeah, because I was not a fan of him as our manager, but he's a lot better than Andy Green. Well, what about um, any dark horse candidates you think uh, might be considered? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, because AC made it sound like they're going for an experienced guy. So a dark horse to me would qualify as like, you know, a Josh Bard or a Phil Nevin, you know, like a former player that's coaching right now. And it just doesn't, it just doesn't seem like we're going to go that route to me. I mean, I know, obviously, I'd love to see Poway Phil Nevin, you know, wouldn't that be great? And, and well, I don't know if he's ever managed. Well, he's managed in the minor leagues before. I don't know how good of a manager he would be, but one thing for sure is he'd sure bring intensity. Yeah, he would. He'd and that's kind of what this team needs a little bit. He'd have a, a little presence. kick in the ass sometimes. Yes. Presence, playing with an edge, all of that. And a great guy. Uh, got a chance to meet him and his family. Um, and he's he did have success, I think, with the Reno Aces. Yes, he won, uh, I believe, 2014, he won the Pacific Coast League with them. Yeah. But, you know, I think... I don't think management would ever go for hiring another rookie manager. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, yeah. AC's writing all this, this stuff about how they're looking for a guy who's managed before. Right. And Because even if they... Even if they did go for a rookie manager, they would just be having to defend that decision over and over again. So and we just saw that with Andy Green. Like, and we haven't actually hired a manager who's had previous experience at the time of his hiring since, um, I believe, Jack McKeon in the 80s. Holy crap. That was the last time we hired a guy who had previously managed at that point. Well, yeah. God damn. Because Bochy so, had never managed when we hired yeah. him as manager. And then we had Black. And who had never had, managed. And then we had Green. Yes. So, um, yeah, and who who were the guys before that? It was... Um, uh, well, I, that I was before my time, so... Yeah, I can't remember all the names, but yeah, McKeon was our general manager, and then he was the manager, It right? was Dick Williams, then somebody else, then McKeon, I think. Okay, and where did McKeon manage before that? I'm not sure. He, well, he's a longtime baseball yeah. guy. Yeah, but that's amazing, actually. That you, I never really thought of that. So, yeah, it would be nice. You know, we, we're bringing in, you know, top name free agents. Yeah. Let's Might bring as well in a, bring in a big name manager. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even Brad Osmus, like that, that doesn't excite me. But, you know, maybe it sounds like in Anaheim, he was dealt a tough hand there. I mean, you know, they didn't have a great, they had a pretty bad rotation, you know. Then Tyler Skaggs' death happened. And then, you know, they had a bunch of injuries down the stretch. So. To say the last year, what happened this year in Anaheim, that's not on Osmus. And I heard from one of my friends who's an Angel fan that he was actually much better than he was in Detroit. And got, that can happen with managers. Like, like I'm not, like, vouching for Osmus here. Like, 
he's not my top choice by any means, but I mean, Tony La Russa failed in Chicago with the White Sox. Then look what he did in Oakland and St. Louis. Oh, yeah. So I mean, you can get better as you go. I mean, maybe Osmus can do that. He seems like a smart guy, but still nowhere near the top of my list. I mean, if we're assuming Madden goes to Anaheim here, then Buck Showalter's at the top of my list. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah, there, there are a lot of guys that their first gig managing, they struggle. Like, look at Bill Belichick. You know, he sucked with the Browns, you know? Well, he's the last Browns coach <laughs> to win a playoff game, so oh. how bad did he really suck? Okay, there, okay, he there you go. He won a playoff game with the Browns. All That's right. always a minor miracle. <laughs> well, he did a little better with the New England Patriots. Well, he was sub-500 in Cleveland, so actually, you're yeah. right. I was joking about, yeah, I, like, the I, Browns I know, I know. not winning, but... I, I, I kind of got... Yeah, all right, right on. So, yeah, so Madden, number one choice, if not Madden, then Showalter. Yes. That's what you'd like to see. You feel in the same way? Yeah, Experienced I guy? I think, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think especially um, I like your rationale about Madden maybe having the secret sauce for Will Myers. Um, I think that's good. I think Madden is a bold manager, a risk taking manager. And he's going to have his guys back. Like, it seemed like Andy Green, like, didn't re- wouldn't really fight for his team. Like, even when um that interference call that Bill Welke called him a Machado, like, and, you know, Green got ejected arguing that, but, you know, he, he's not tough about it. Like, he's just out there, like, because he has to be, basically. Like, <laughs> like that was when he spit on the umpire and apologized to him for it. Like, screw that, man. Like, go out there and fight for your team. Right, exactly. You think Lou Pinella ever apologized? Lou Pinella. <laughs> Lou Pinella. Did, was, didn't he, like, pick up one of the bases and throw it one time? Yeah. <laughs> can never picture Andy Green doing that. No. Um, all right, so let's say you know it's Madden or Show Walter. You know that'd be a great way to get started. Do you Absolutely. think? Do you think they retain any of the coaches? That's an interesting point. Um, if they're going to hire an experienced manager, I would sure hope that they let the um, that the new manager pick out his coaching staff. Mm-hmm. And the only coaches that I would spare are Schumacher and Balsley. Every other coach can go as far as I care. And even Balsley can be replaced, in my opinion. I mean, he's kind of an old school pitching coach. So if they bring in some guy who's like worked under like whatever secrets, who's worked in Houston, like in their minor leagues, like maybe he knows some of the secret stuff that stuff that Houston uses on every pitcher that comes in. Like if you can find an analytic guy like that to replace Balsley because Balsley seems really old school. That's fine by me. But I would spare uh, Schumacher and Balsley, mm-hmm. or at least consider them to be spared. Well, a lot of people like Schumacher. Uh-huh. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. But can you imagine if the Padres front office fired Glenn Hoffman? That would be uh, pretty heavy, wouldn't it? I mean, Glenn's a good guy, but I mean, how long has he been here? I mean, that's not... A lot of people seem a little sentimental to him because he's been here for so long. I'm not really. He took over third base for Flannery, right? Yes. I don't even think he's that bad of a third base coach. I just think, you know, we could move on. Yeah. He's been here a while. A new voice. Yeah, right on. And now you can argue the same thing for Balsley, although Balsley's earned a lot of leeway with what he's done with a lot of pitchers, like Kirby Yates and Brad Hand the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, then God knows who they hire as their hitting coach. That's the worst job in professional sports, the hitting coach for the Padres. <laughs> that job is more dangerous than defense <laughs> against the dark arts teacher in Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, it's brutal, man. That, it's, it's, that's a tough gig. All right, so let's go through the roster, the the players. So, yeah, I mean, um, it doesn't do matter want? who they hire as manager. They don't get better players. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the players. All right, so um, you want to go around the around the horn yeah. defensively? So. Yeah, we'll start You know, in positional order for the number. Of, we'll start with position players and go in number order of position. So, like, we'll start with catcher and end with right field. Right on. Okay. All right, so catcher, Mejia. Um, I, I, talk, I think I touched about it briefly on the first time I was on here about the whole thing where I don't believe his ERA versus Hedges ERA is a valid comparison because Hedges caught, you know, April, May when it's harder to hit at Petco and we were getting fluke starts from Strom and Mark Gavages. Right. Yeah. Mark Gavages. Okay. Yeah. We'll get okay, him yeah. when we get to the pitchers. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought Mejia improved a lot defensively mm-hmm. and he hit after he came back up. Uh, he was great hitting. Yeah. Yeah. He, d- he still could be a little more patient, but I mean, he can, Hit, he can hit. He can hit a double down the line. He's got some pop. You know, he has the ability. I think he has the ability. I mean, what he hit, 270 this year? I think he's got the ability to be a 280, 285 hitter. You know, 15, 20 home runs, 30, 35 doubles. And, and even defensively, we, we saw him. Um, he, he he improved throughout the course of the year. And, Absolutely. And he is, at minimum, an average catcher, wouldn't you say? I'd say so. I mean, he's he got some strikes, uh, framing pitches. Um, 
You know, I think he's got a better arm than Hedges. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not great blocking balls, but he's getting better. And, you know, if you keep Barajas around as the bench coach or if you don't make him the full-time manager, I mean, Barajas was doing a lot of good work with him defensively. Right. Yeah, that seemed pretty obvious. And Barajas, a former catcher who stuck in the league because of his defense for so long, credited Mejia for improving. So what the hell do you do with Austin Hedges? <coughs> oh, God. I'd trade him. I mean, I just can't stand his attitude. I mean, he's like, well, I should be playing more. You know, I should win a gold glove at catcher. He comes out and says that, and then the next day he can't catch a two-hopper relay throw home that lets the only run of the game score. Mm-hmm. And I think his defense is overrated. Like, sure, he's great at pitch framing and handling and pitching staff, but he doesn't make very good throws a lot of the time, I don't think. His pop time is really good, and it helps him get throws down there, but sometimes his throws are just nowhere close. Like the one, I don't know if you saw it, the last game in Milwaukee, the guy hit a double, there was a relay home, he was going to third on the throw, Hedges just yanks the throw into left field, and the guy scores. Oh. Well, so it, I think his defense is a little overrated because of that. It's good, but it's not fantastic. Like, Well, according to the stats, guys, you know they, they've figured it out, and they say he's the top catcher in the league if not one of the top defensive players in the league right uh the, yeah that's true but i disagree with that i mean having watched actually watched the guy i think he's a good maybe great defensive catcher but one of the best that's a big stretch for me so let's say you trade him i mean really the guy's what like a 180 hitter i mean what are you gonna get for the guy i mean he actually has good value despite that because the problem with him on our team is that He's not the only hole in the lineup offensively. Like, if you trade him to, like, the Astros or the Yankees, I mean, I mean, obviously the Yankees have Sanchez, but, you know, backup catcher, you know, maybe catch him and DH Sanchez more. Like, teams like that can afford to have a guy like that in there just because of his defense, like, and not need to care about his offense because they're loaded at every other position. Right, so they can have one so weak for, link. Yeah. So for teams like that, they can have one weak link, you mm-hmm. know, he's valuable for that. One week league offensively, he's valuable because of his defense for that. So yeah, so maybe we can get a little something in return for Absolutely. him. Absolutely, and then I like Terenz. I mean, his his stats and the fourteen fifteen play appearances, whatever it was down the stretch. You know, you look at it, you're like, oh, whatever. But I mean, he just looked much better, like an actual major leaguer. I mean, I know that I, the reports that I saw that he had really made huge strides in the minor leagues. Yeah, and you could tell just in the short time he was up, like not necessarily in the box score, but like just the way he looked at the play, you could tell he made strides. Okay, so then there's Austin Allen, and then if you go further, no, I'm I'm completely done with Austin Allen. I mean, he's not a good defensive catcher at all, and he didn't hit like he did in the minor leagues when he came up. Seems like a four A guy to me. All right, on okay, and then if you go deeper into the depth chart, there's what Luis. How do you say his name? Campanoso? Campusano. Campusano. Pardon He's me. He's still down at Elsinore. That guy's two years away, probably. Okay. Um, all right. So um, so maybe we go with Mejia, number one, and uh, and maybe Torrens, too? Yeah. And if you if you still think Torrens, you know, could use time in AAA, I mean, go sign a veteran catcher. I mean, you can always find defense-first veteran catchers in free agency. Right. I don't even have to look at the list to tell you you can find one, because there's, there's ones out there every year. Well, or why don't we just keep Hedges? Just to be that guy. I mean, it doesn't seem... The problem with that is that it doesn't seem like Hedges wants to accept that role. Like, that's a guy who wants to play. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then we'll have a disgruntled guy in the, yeah. in the clubhouse and that I mean, I, wonder, I almost wonder if Hedges being a disgruntled guy was part of the problem down the stretch. Mm, could be. I mean, obviously not saying, well, they went 7-20 and 20 in September because Austin <laughs> Hedges is over there whining about his playing time. I mean, I'm not saying that at all, yeah, but right. he, he couldn't have helped if he's out there thinking he should play more and he's not. But you, I do like that where a guy thinks that he deserves the time. You know, he wants to be there. Um, but yeah, his offense just didn't warrant him being there. Yeah, if you want, if you think that, that's fine. Just don't say that publicly and right. cause a, a distraction like he did. Exactly right. You're exactly right. All right, let's look at first base. I mean, everyone, a lot of people with all their computer numbers like to say Eric Hosmer is like the worst first baseman in MLB history. Yeah, I don't get that. I mean... Sure. Okay. He hits too many ground balls. Great. Yeah. What? Yeah. Look. Look what happened when he tried to lift the ball more. His strikeout soared. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the it's like well, there's nothing wrong with wrong with a line drive down the left field line. Not everything has to be a home run. So he had definitely stretches during the season where he was really producing. Most of the year he was pretty good. I mean, he was mm-hmm. hitting the walk rate was never there, so the on base percentage was low. I don't know why that was. Maybe it was just you know he 
you know, quit on the season, just kind of going through the motions, you know, hacking to try and get the bat over with or whatever. But most of the season, he was pretty good, pretty productive, always hit with people on base the first five months of the season. Yeah, yeah he did. Really good going the other way. The only the, yeah. the biggest problem I have with Hosmer is not in his offense because it was good for five months and then you know he quit and uh, he quit on any degree in September and the numbers tanked. So that's not a worry for me going forward. September in general, I'm just gonna put this out right now. That seven and twenty you saw any individual were in September. I don't take into account any of that going forward. It means nothing to me because I just think they quit on the manager right. and didn't have their spark plug. So that 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 means nothing to me going forward. Now some some of the fans think we should trade Hosmer. Well, he's got a, no, a partial no trade through next year. That's the problem. Why I don't see it happening. Right, and it's a big contract. Yeah, yeah. And you know all these computer teams with all their fan graphs value contracts would never take that guy. Would never take him. Even though I don't think he's that bad. Now, the one thing is his defense was awful this year. That's the only major complaint I have about him is his defense. His defense was completely terrible this year. So what's up with that? I mean, he's a former gold glove guy, right? <clears throat> the fact that he has not one, not two, not three, but four of them makes me question the gold glove award. Really? Or maybe the competition in the American League just wasn't there. I mean, the American League is pretty bad for first baseman right now. I mean, Daniel Vogelbach was an all-star first baseman this year, I mean, in the American League. I mean, mm -hmm. the competition over there is not very good. I mean, you look at all the guys who are the best right now, I'd say Goldschmidt and um, Goldschmidt, Rizzo, and Freeman are probably the best in the game right now. Those are all NL guys. And then other guys like Joey Votto, who were in as in recent up until the last year or two, were considered one of the best first basemen. All those guys were in the NL. You know, when Pujols was good, he was in the NL mm -hmm. with uh, St. Louis. Um, and then obviously Goldschmidt was you know always in the NL with Arizona and St. Louis. And, and then and, and you know Bellinger played a lot of first. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, Brandon Belt was good a couple years ago. And he's then, not really good anymore. Who's the guy for the Pirates? Is it Bell? Josh Bell? He plays first. Doesn't yes, he, he does. Um, so, so yeah. yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah, the competition in the AL pro for first base just isn't that good for like a Gold Glove award. So maybe that's why you want it kind of like by default. Maybe it's like Keith Moreland over there. You know, <laughs> it's a different different thing. Anyways, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just don't. It's not like as bad as it was this year. I don't know what happened this year. I mean, I just think overall the defense and like the focus level was bad because, you know, we didn't have a manager that was like on these guys asses, you know. Right. So I think in general, some of them just look like concentration errors, which, you know, if that's the case, that can be fixed. You know, if we get a manager that's going to come in here and kick these guys' asses and be like, okay, focus up, but guys. Right. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, some of them, like, he's not scooping balls. You know, he's missing easy ones. You know, he's not getting to balls. You know, some, making bad decisions. On, this is one I think that a new manager could fix too is like, there's no, like, because it's kind of a discipline thing. It's just like, Recklessly throwing to bases, like when he's got no shot getting the guy, he should just take the out. Well, he did that a few times when they laid down a sack bunt, and he would try to get the force <laughs> at second base. Oh and, yeah, and then the ball would go out to, into the outfield. Or isn't that's actually how uh, um, Tatis got hurt? Well, that it? was a pitcher throwing to a base. Oh, it was a pitcher. Pardon it was me. Matt Wisler. Yeah, um, but. Um, you know, Hos Hosmer did that a number of times where he would throw to the to try to get the lead runner. And that's a tough, you know, out to get. Yeah. Well, a lot of times he'd throw it and, you know, it wouldn't be a bad throw, but the guy would be safe. It's like, why are you throwing that ball? Yeah. Take the out. They're giving it to you. Yeah. All right. Let's move around the diamond. Second base. That's a, that's going to be a big decision for the organization. Yeah. I mean, Urias, he hasn't lived up to the expectations yet. You can make the argument. Well, they didn't play him in April. And I, w I was defending him then because they didn't give him a fair shot in April. Like they sent him down to AAA. Then they brought him up only to have him split time with Kinsler. That had to destroy his confidence. Kinsler. <laughs> and then, um, you know, he hit pretty well for a while after coming back up. Then he kind of struggled again. He was kind of up and down the rest of the way. I mean, I don't know. I mean. If you can fill your other needs in which I think is mostly the outfield. Right. If you can get if you can fill fill some holes in the outfield, I think you can live with um trying to give Arias another chance of you fill in the holes in the outfield because he still has it in him, but I mean, if you're going to trade him for an ace, which we can get into as part of the package for an ace, I mean, if Mike Moustakis declines his 11 million dollar mutual option, maybe go after him to play second base that's left-handed bat. Right. I mean, after the way free agency's gone for him the last two years, though, I can't see him turning down eleven million. No, oh, yeah, yeah. After no the way. way free agency's gone, very much not as expected for him the last two years. So that's probably not going to be an option. Okay, for Mustakis. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, 
I'd probably just stick with Arias because I don't see the need to trade for an ace, which we can get to when we get to the pitching. Mm-hmm. But but if you don't use Urias at second, who do you got? What, well, what you are got the Owen Miller, but he hasn't played AAA yet even, although playing AAA can almost be bad for hitter's development because you can get in bad habits in the Pacific Coast League. Right, yeah, yeah, right on. Um, and then... What is it? C.J. Abrams is a shortstop, and he's way down, right? Oh, he's he, he just moved up, moved up to Fort Wayne. Yeah, we so drafted he, that guy this year yeah, out so of high he, school. That's not a guy we. He's can be got thinking a long about. ways to go. We can't be thinking about that guy in him soon. Right. So, there, is there any other um, <coughs> second base opportunity other than you know the the you know Garcia Kinsler? Um, you know, uh, France. I mean, France, I don't see him as an everyday player at the major league level. Maybe as a utility guy. Garcia is a great utility guy, not a guy I'd play every day. Kinsler, just get him out of here. Yeah, the guy, right on. Yeah. He was terrible. You know, he hated the fans. He flipped them off, man. <laughs> <laughs> Big F you to the fans yeah, after he, he had was, a home run. He was brutal. You know, he was brutal offensively, too, even at... I mean, that one's, I can see, he's a pretty good second baseman with Texas and Detroit, but I mean, he's just up there in age now. It seemed like they signed him very early in the offseason last year before they really made the decision to pursue Machado. And that's the thing is that I think if that they knew they were going after Machado from day one, I don't think they would have signed him. So yeah, exactly. That's why I think he's just going to be DFA'd and we'll be done with that horrible experience with the horrible Ian Kinsler experience will be done. So that was like an eight million two year deal, right? Yeah, something like that. So it's like four million. I mean, it sounds easy just to say, ah, oh, four million, but for the Padres, that probably makes sense. Just let him go. Yeah. If, if you can package him in a deal bonus, but you probably just won't DFA him. I mean, eat the three or four million. We've eaten a lot more than that. Um, okay, so um, shortstop is Tatis, right? I mean, that's and, and third is Machado. I mean, we we talked about Machado. We. Talked about Tatis. I mean, he's just fantastic. You know, he's a spark plug at the top of the order when he, you know, hits a home run or he singles and steals second, goes third on a ground ball or, or gets to second on a slow roller and then, you know, goes third on a wild pitch, scores on, you know, a sack fly, which can be a pop-up to the second baseman. <laughs> well, do you think, uh, I, I hate to say this, I don't want to jinx it, but is Tatis injury prone? Is he fragile? I don't think he's necessarily fragile because, I mean, you can say, well, he suffered two straight season nine injuries, but, I mean, anybody can hurt their thumb sliding into second base. Right. And, you know, the play where he, no, like, that was a completely freak accident, the play in Washington. Like, nobody, that anybody who did that would get hurt. Oh, where he did the splits. Yeah. yeah, yeah anybody yeah. who did that would get hurt. Right. And then the back injury, people kind of freaked out about that, but it's actually pretty common in young athletes, and I don't think it was as bad as people thought because... He looked pretty healthy, like when he was in the dugout, like down the stretch. It seems like he could have. It seems like if we were in a playoff race, you know, he could have come back, you know, early middle of September if we were like in a playoff race. Well, I think people are always so, you know, um, sensitive around back injuries because they know how tricky those are. Yeah. Um, so, so if you let's just say you have Hosmer, Urias, um, Tatis, and Machado, who are your backup guys for twenty twenty? Well, Garcia can be in that discussion. Garcia should be there. France can be in that discussion. Um, you know, those two guys. And then, um, you know, Mejia's brain even. He was a lot better than I thought he would be. Maybe he can be a guy who goes up and down between AAA and the MLB if, you know, like somebody gets hurt. Yeah. How old is he? Like 27, 28? Yeah, he's not a youngster. No, but he's a guy who can, you know, shuttle between AAA and the MLB and give you some, you know, we or two or a month in the MLB while somebody's hurt. You know, not a guy you want on the roster full time, but maybe a guy who's passable off the bench for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I didn't really know much about him. Neither did I. Him, you know, so it just seems like it was maybe his turn, you know, to, yeah. get, a, to yeah. get a cup of coffee, right? Yeah. But yeah, he showed something, you know, so yeah, so maybe he could be a guy too. All right, now let's have some fun. Let's go to the outfield. <laughs> you want to start in left? Yeah, okay. I guess I'll start with Will Myers. All right, here we go. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting one. I've talked about the poor timing of that extension. We talked about that the first time I was on here. The extension looks completely terrible now. I mean, you got three years for $30 million for a guy who, if we're being honest here, he hasn't been good since the first half of 2016. Mm-hmm. And... I don't know. So many people on Twitter still love this guy, still defend him. They're like, oh, well, they moved him off first base in the outfield, and that messed with him. It's like, look at 2017. He hit like 222 with the Arsenal scoring position and set the franchise record for strikeouts. And he was playing first base then all year long. So 
I don't get that excuse. I don't get why people make that excuse. You know, players, especially in today's game, move around a lot. I mean, look at the Dodger lineup. Those guys are like interchangeable pieces. Yeah, it doesn't affect their hitting. Doesn't no. affect Cattell Marte in Arizona. No. Doesn't affect those guys. So, no. yeah. I mean, anybody who makes that excuse, it's like, that's how you play baseball. They're like, oh, well, poor Will. Leave him alone in left yeah. field. Let him focus on him. It's like, <laughs> This is baseball in 2019. You got guys moving all over the place. Right, exactly. Tell Marte, you know, second base, shortstop, center field, Bellinger, center field, right field, first base, you know, Max Muncy, second base, first base, third base. So, you know, but Fowler's done with him, right? <coughs> yeah, I mean, he said he'd eat, you know, 10, 15 million to get rid of him. And the, the way you look, the when you think of that initially, you're like, oh, we're paying him 10, 15 million, not playing our team anymore. I mean, that's still getting, you know, if you're getting, that's still getting 45, 50 million off the books the next three years, even if you're eating 10, 15 million. So when you think about it that way, you're like, okay, there's something. Right. So maybe you take Myers and uh, maybe a prospect or two, package them, eat some money, and then get maybe another prospect back. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. I mean, I don't know if they're going to do that. It sounds like they're going to try to do that. We'll see what happens. I hope they're able to pull it off just because you can't kill on him. Like, he'll have spurts where he lives up. I've said this, and I've said this before. Like, if he wanted, if he had, you know, the heart, you know, if his head was in it, you know, he could be the third best position player on the team after Manny Machado and Fernando Tatis Jr. Like, right. he has that kind of talent, you know, with the swing, you know, the athleticism, but. He just doesn't put it together. I don't know if he's does it, if he's lazy or if he's a head case or what the deal is, but he just can't put it together. And you see it for a short spur of time. You're like, oh, my God, that Myers we saw in the first half of 2016. Here we go. And then he just goes back to, you know, being crap after that. It's like Chase Headley when he had that one great half of a season. Oh, you know? absolutely. Um, but I know I root for Myers, too. And well, he, I root for anybody who's on the Padres because I want them to help the team win. I even yeah. wanted Andy Green to become a better manager because that would help yeah. the team win. But, yeah. I mean, I root for guys on the Padres to do good because it helps the team. But for Myers, he just he can't put it together. Yeah, he can't. I, I, I think, and I don't think, I think we should be done counting on him for right. that. I think, well, it's all part of that developmental bullshit, right? Yeah. So I think we got to turn the page and go with someone that's proven. I mean, yeah, I mean, we can talk about, you know, guys like the Padres can trade for almost anybody they want because of how good the farm system is. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying they're going to give, I would give up the farm for Mike Trout. I wouldn't do that because that's one, because I mean, we're seeing in Anaheim right now that he can't do it alone and we need more guys than that. So I wouldn't do necessarily that and have like no farm and just get one guy, but if you're um but I mean if you're AJ Preller, you got a lot of trade chips out there. I mean, you talk you see Boston, you know, talking about how they how it would be hard for them to keep JD Martinez and Mookie Betts on the same roster. Mm -hmm. But maybe if they do, maybe they have to trade Andrew Benintendi. I don't know. That would be a guy, you know, there was some rumors about that at the deadline. I don't know how true that was, but Boston looks like they're gonna have to retool and you know, they got rid of Dombrowski just like Detroit did when they wanted to retool. And you know, so maybe when they retool, maybe you can get Andrew Benintendi. You know, that's the guy we need. You know, mm -hmm. he's an outfielder, which we need. Left-handed bat, doesn't suck defensively. He's athletic. He's pretty young. I mean, that's the guy I would look at a trade if Boston's really going to go say, we're going to have to retool. He's available. If Boston makes him available, I'm going to get an Andrew Benintendi. Yeah, and he's a highly touted young guy. I mean, Absolutely. He's been, I mean, been he was the number one prospect in baseball, what, three, four years ago? So we'll trade him for the other former number one prospect in baseball, Will Myers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't. I know you're joking, but I yeah. mean that would just make no sense for yeah. Boston because they're, they're trying yeah. to get under the luxury tax, yeah. right? And Myers would be a huge number against that, right? I mean, what could happen though is maybe you see, you know, a Will Myers David Price swap. Yeah, actually, that's a pretty good move right there. Because I believe Price is making more money per year over the next couple of years than Myers is. So maybe a Myers David Price swap we could be talking, right? I mean that's something that I could see. What about Chris Sale? No, I wouldn't go for Chris Sale. I mean, his arm issues kind of worry me, especially for not not a real big guy, and he's had some arm issues last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of potential uh, <clears throat> landing spots for Myers. Um, let's move over to center field. So what do you think we should do over there? I mean, well, you got Trammell coming. That's good, but he's not going to be here opening day. And it sounds like Fowler's sick of losing and waiting, and he's going to make moves to win in 2020. I mean, Margot, you know, he hits against lefties. That's awesome. He hits against left-hand pitchers. That's great. Against a righty, 
nope, doesn't do it. So maybe you just, I don't know, find like a left-handed bat, you know, maybe a guy, somebody, even a righty with reverse splits. Um, I don't know, somebody you can hit right-handed pitchers and have him out there against righties with Margot against lefties until Tremel comes up. Mm -hmm. And then when Tremel comes up, he becomes a fourth alpha. Or that's the kind of guy I look at center field. Specific names, I can't name one right now, but I'm sure there's a guy out there, you know, like. So it, it'd be like we used to have before, where it's a defined platoon. Yes. Right? It's and not, you'd only be doing this until Tremel came up, which I think could happen by like June or July. Right. Okay. Um, and then uh, right field. We got Renfro. We've got Naylor. I mean, what's the answer in right field? All right. Here's how I say it. Renfro, fantastic against left-handed pitchers. You know, you can... He'll hit him, you know, he'll hit home runs against righties or lefties. Against lefties, he'll hit for a better average. You know, I don't know if he sees the ball better or what. Against righties, he's just not an everyday player. I mean, even if you threw a left-handed pitcher 162 games a year, I still don't think he'd be an everyday player. Right. <coughs> but, I mean, against lefties, he's fine. I mean, if you can get a guy who, um, you know, a guy who hits right-handed pitchers, you know, maybe get Corey Dickerson and platoon him with... um. With Renfro, you know, Corey Dickerson's a guy, I mean, he's a free swinger, but I mean, mm -hmm. he hits righties really well, I mean, and then have Renfro play against lefties, that could work. Another, we're talking about reverse splits, I mean, Yasiel Puig's a free agent, I mean, the Dodgers didn't play him against lefties because of his reverse splits, but I mean, we're looking for a guy who can hit righties, because we had one of the worst offense against right-hand pitchers and a top 10 offense against lefties. So well, we're Really? Yeah. I, I didn't know that. So we're looking for, you know... Guys who can hit right-handed pitchers, and you know Puig's a reverse splits guy. And normally teams think of reverse splits guys to be a negative, but a reverse splits guy like Puig would be a positive for us. So reverse splits means like a right-handed hitter that hits right-handed pitching better yes. than left-handed pitching, or a left or a lefty who hits left-handed pitchers better than righties. Which okay. it, that seems a, that doesn't seem common to begin with, but it seems a lot more common for righties than lefties. Yeah, I was gonna say it's something of a unicorn. I mean, that's a pretty rare thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so what about Naylor? What do you do with him? Naylor, I mean, I like the guy. He, you know, he brings energy, you know, he'll hit with guys on base. I mean, I just don't know if he's consistent enough and if his defense is good enough to play every day. Um, and then you've got Jankowski and Martini. And I mean, I think you can just move on from all those guys. Right. So Martini, well, he's maybe worth getting a jersey just for his name. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so if you were to wave a magic wand, what would your outfield look like for 2020? Is this bringing in outside guys? Whoever, yeah. Well, I think a trade for Andrew Benintendi would look nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pittsburgh's kind of a mess right now, so I'd try and get Starling Marte away from them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your center fielder until... Um, you know, Mark until Tremel comes up. Right. And then, you know, right field, you have a Dickerson Renfro platoon. And then again, when Tremel comes up, you can move Marte over to left, Ben Intendi to right, or put Marte in right, whatever, and just have Dickerson and Renfro both off the bench. So pretty much wipe the slate clean. I yeah. mean, you know, none of the guys are really the answer. I mean, I like the infield and I like Mejia at catcher, but I'd I'd wipe the clean I'd wipe the slate clean for center field. Well, it's interesting. Or, I mean, not center field, outfield, the sorry. The whole outfield. Yes. Going into the season, we thought we had an abundance of know, outfield that's the, resources. That's the funny thing is that we came into this with, like, the outfield, like, that's going to be our strength. You know, we have, how are we going to play all these guys? And now we're at the position where, like, we're going to wipe the slate clean. I want all new ones. So Unbelievable. So I'd start the season with Ben Intendi in left, uh, trade for him from Boston. Um, Marte in center, trade for him from Pittsburgh. And then sign Corey Dickerson, platoon him with Renfro and right. And then when Tramel comes up, you put, you know, him in center and then, you know, Marte in right or Marte in left, Ben Tenney going over to right. Either one doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. And that's where I go from there for that, the outfield. Okay. Infield, I like I like the infield. Like, I'm willing to give Arias a shot. And, you know, if he doesn't work in 2020, you got Owen Miller and then Xavier Edwards behind him. So I'm willing to give Arias a shot for 2020. And then I like... Obviously, Machado and Tatis, and I don't think Hosmer totally sucks. I actually think he's somewhat productive. And then you got Mejia, catcher, who I like. So the outfield would be my big focus. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, so now that brings us <coughs> to the pitching staff. And, you know, you've, you've hinted about it. Maybe we need to sign a, um, you know, a big name guy, we, or maybe we need to trade for a big name guy. Here's how I feel about the pitching. It feels like a common thing on Padres Twitter is like, what ace are we going to get? How are we going to 
get that ace for pitching. Like, it's like, and to me, that's the wrong thinking. It's like, we need bats in the outfield, which we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Pitching wise, you're looking pretty good. And here's what I'm saying this I mean, you got Paddock next year. He's not going to be on an innings limit. You got Nelson Lamette and Garrett Richards, another year removed from Tommy John surgery. And Lamette looked fantastic after his first couple starts, which yeah. is basically what which is basically what Richards had when, when he was up. That's basically like the first couple starts back, which are always going to be rough like they were for Lamette. But after that, Lamette was pretty good. Yeah. So I think Richards will be good next year if he can stay healthy. I mean, I mean, you got Mackenzie Gore and Luis Patino, two of the best pitching prospects in baseball coming. And while I do think we're going to trade prospects this winter, I don't see it being those two. I think those two are basically untouchable. Agreed. But they, those guys won't be on the opening day roster. No. They? Yeah. I'd say Gore, May, June, Patino, a little after that, because Gore came up a little sooner than Patino did. So what about, what about all the other guys that have been in our starting <laughs> rotation? You know, um, Lucchese, uh, Lauer. Lucchese. I mean, who, do you keep Lu any of those guys? I like Lucchese. I mean, I think he's a good – I think he's a – I think he's a plenty good enough fifth starter on a competitive team. Um, you know, he's pretty good at Petco. You know, sometimes he gets beat up a little on the road or if he goes through the order a third time, well, hopefully we have a manager and deep mm -hmm. enough bullpen, manager smart enough and a deep enough bullpen to not ha need him a third time through. We'll get into the bullpen later. I'm actually kind of optimistic about that. Lauer, I mean, he just, that's just not it as a starter for me. I mean, Maybe as a reliever, when he could, you know, attack the zone and increase his velocity consistently, he'd be good. I think he'd be good out of the bullpen as a starter. Just not a fan. Is he like Robbie Erland, just another lefty that yeah. isn't? Yeah. 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 So um, so who else started? We talked about Margavichus. Oh, uh, he's, he's got to go. I mean, he was a fluke that he had a little yeah. bit of success originally. Yeah, and then, you know, people are like, oh, this is a lefty throwing straight 89-mile-an-hour fastballs. And yeah. Then that was it for him. Mm-hmm. And then who else started for the Padres this year? Strom. He'll be in the bullpen. I mean, yeah. Strom's, you know, the classic, you know, reliever. They tried to make a starter. That didn't work. Mm -hmm. And then anyone else get a start for the for the Padres? <sighs> well, we talked about, you know, obviously Paddock, Richards. Well, there was a couple Lamette. of young guys that got starts, right, that they brought up. Pedro Avila, I, this is a real shame because I really liked what he had. You know, that one start in Arizona and then. He needed Tommy Johnny blew out his arm in the minors. And then Morhone had a start. Yeah, that two. was like an opener thing, though. Yeah. Like, oh, we forgot Cal Quantrill. Oh, Quantrill. Yeah. Here's the thing I want to say about Cal Quantrill. Yeah. Which kind of gets back to my Mejia versus Hedges point is that remember when Quantrill had that like four or five start stretch where he just got bombed like four yeah. or five? Guess who was catching him then? Austin Hedges. Really? And he was doing great when Mejia was catching him. So what are all the Hedges fanboys who are like, well, Mejia can't handle a staff. Where are they now on that? Where are they now on that Where one? are the Hedges fanboys? Yeah, where are they now that <laughs> Mejia was way better for Quantrill? And I believe Paddock had a better ERA with Mejia, too, catching, actually. So is Quantrill a starter? Uh, yeah, I think I'd, I'd be fine with Quantrill as a starter or okay. a reliever, either one. Although, I think he's a real good candidate to get traded this winter. Okay, so... Um so what's so what's your ideal opening day five man rotation? All right, so let's just say that we do make that Myers um, price swap. Okay. Let's say it's I don't know Myers and three prospects to Boston for Benintendi and Price. Okay. Let's just say it's that. All right. Okay. And then you you go with Paddock opening day. You know, Price as your Tony Gwynn opening day number two guy. Mm -hmm. You got Lamette, Richards, and then I'd go a competition for between Quantrill and Lucchese and Lauer, assuming they're all here. But right. let's just say Quantrill goes with to Boston in that trade. Okay. and um, Or to Pittsburgh for Marte, right. and he's not here. And then you just have Lucchese as your five. Or maybe you sign, you know, Cole Hamill's RB guy. Yeah, right on. Um, is he going to be a free agent? Yes, he is. Really? Or another veteran starter, you know, that's out there. Have yeah. Maybe a buy low bounce back guy. Because it seems like every good pitching staff has that one, like, buy low bounce back guy. Yeah. So maybe, like, I don't know, Rick Porcello. Maybe see if he can bounce back here um, as a five starter. I don't know. Somebody like that. Mm -hmm. Um. If you trade Lucchese. But, I mean, I, I'm fine with Lucchese as the fifth starter, like I said. What about Bumgarner? I mean, I don't like the guy, but, I mean... Are we trying to be nice guys, or are we trying to win here? Yeah. Well, he's got an edge, right? He'll, he's, yeah, he's got an edge. I mean, <laughs> I mean, are we? What kind of? First of all, 
he was kind of declining until the second half of this year, so that's a little bit of a concern for me. And what kind of contract is he going to want? You know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying this because I absolutely can't stand the guy, but because I have, there's guys that I absolutely can't stand that if they became were to become a free agent, I'd be like, get them on my team right now because they're good players. I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's legit concerns with Bumgarner. Mm-hmm. So I would just pass on that because of that. Not because I can't stand the guy, but because there's some legit concerns there. So what if they don't make a trade for a price or another, you know, ace? Then what is your rotation? Well, I look wouldn't like? consider a price an ace anymore. Okay. So but what, I see what you're trying to say, though. Yeah. So then what what would it be then? I mean, I just put, you know, Quantrill, whoever's still here, is the five guy. Okay. And then Lucchese's your four. Yeah. Okay. All right, so then what about the bullpen? You're optimistic there. Yes, I am. And people are like, oh, my God, our bullpen's the worst. I mean, I think people said that because we're spoiled to, you know, having a lights-out bullpen even when we are terrible. Like, last year we were awful, but our bullpen was, you know, yeah, real good. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, Kirby Yates was fantastic. Will he repeat what he did this year? Probably not. Will he still be a very good closer? I think so. But some people want to trade Yates. They think he's a, he's a chip that can be moved. I mean, if you can... If you're confident that Munoz can close, then you could think about it. I wouldn't do it, though. Okay. Um, and then, you know, Munoz, setup man. Right. Castillo, I mean, we really missed him this year. How many games were decided because a big left-hand hitter came up and, you know, got a home run off Wick or some righty, <laughs> you know. Wick, yeah. yeah. That's another thing yeah. is that people are worried about the bullpen. I mean, Brad Wick's not here pitching high leverage situations anymore. Mm-hmm. Robbie Erland's going to be gone. Right. Uh, Matt Wizzler's already gone. Phil Mayen's already gone. All these, you know, for lack of a better term, bums that we pitched, that we had to throw in close games, are all gone now, so that helps. Right. And we got a, a manager who's going to manage the bullpen better. So you got you got Yates, you got Munoz as your, as your eighth inning guy. Yep. Um, was his stamina stick around? Uh, no, I would not bring it back. He's a free agent after the year. Okay. So then, you know, you got Strom maybe as your high leverage, you know, seventh yeah, inning kind Castillo, of guy. Castillo, you know, is your seventh inning guy, okay. you know, or maybe if, you know, like bases loaded in the sixth inning, tough left, he's coming up, use him then. Right. I mean, Bednar had his ER. If you just looked at Bednar's ERA, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this guy's terrible. But he had two bad outings in September that really, mm-hmm. in the last week of September that because he was only up in September, but the, the, he had two outings in the last week of the season that brought up like four runs. I mean, that guy's got pretty good stuff. You could put him in there. Eric Yardley, when he first came out, was like, why in the world do we bring this guy up? But he was pretty good on the yeah, stretch, actually. Yeah. So that's a guy who deserves consideration. We talked about Strom, you know, high leverage. And then, you know, you're going to put guys in the bullpen, you know, mm-hmm. that don't make the rotation, like a Lauer, you know, that'll help, or a Quantrill, maybe that'll help. What about Warren and Loop? No. I think those guys are gone. I mean, Warren was terrible before he got hurt. Right. And Loop barely pitched. So, But didn't wasn't Loop on a two-year deal? It was one year with an option, which is the same with Warren. Okay. So I think they're both gone. And Perdomo's gone? Uh, I don't know. I mean, he wasn't as bad as people think he was. Mm-hmm. He wasn't at, he wasn't great, but he wasn't as bad as people thought he was. He was yeah. okay. I mean, I think as a, as a long relief guy, I think he was very serviceable. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't... A guy who was like, oh, my God, this is such a weapon out of your bullpen. But, you know, he got the job done. Right. So a lot of the time. I mean, there were times he didn't. But, you know, he wasn't terrible. So then what about guys like Michelle Baez? Oh, and I then, love Baez. And then Adrian Morahone and some of the younger. To me, Morahone, I would use Morahone as a trade chip just because the upside's still there. But I worry about, you know, his durability. Right. Baez, some people want to extend him out as a starter. I don't. I, I want to keep him in the bullpen. He's He was fantastic out of there for us. Okay. You know, that's a guy who can pitch two innings. That's a huge weapon out of the bullpen. I love Baez. I knew I was forgetting somebody. And Baez, I just really love Baez, you know, out of the bullpen. I would keep him there. It's nice having a six seven guy on the hill, you know? Yeah, could you imagine if you had, like, let's just say you were in a win or go home game next year, and you only needed five from your star, and then you could go Baez, Castillo, Munoz, Yates. I mean, that's what you want right there. That's good. Yeah, that's really that's good. That's why I'm optimistic about the bullpen. Plus, they can always find, you know, veterans, you know, on a buy low deal, like Jeremy Jeffries maybe on a buy low deal. Maybe they can bring Sergio Romo in, you know. Just, you know, veterans who, you know, have pitched Sergio in big Romo. spots. How old is that guy? I don't know, but he's still effective. He's with Minnesota right now. Uh huh. He can still get it done, especially, you know, at Petco. Wow. Um, so, you know, going into the <coughs> season... Um, the the deal with the Padres have said is the rotation was 
you know, the big question mark for the 2019 season. Going into 2020, you're feeling a lot more optimistic. Um, but if you were to look at the team overall, what was the biggest weakness? Was it pitching? Was it defense? Was it hitting? What was the, the biggest thing that we need to fix? Oh, I'd say offense from the outfield. Right. But, I mean, to me, the biggest problem with the team was just there was no consistency. And, like, when they were doing one thing well, they weren't doing another well. Like, in April, May, they were pitching well. They weren't hitting. In June, they scored over six runs a game for the month. They weren't pitching. July and September, they didn't either. August, they were, you know, middle of the road in both. Hmm. So it's just like there was... So that's on the manager, like, maybe then. Maybe, yeah. I mean, they got peace. I've talked about how the offense could have scored a lot more runs if you know they weren't you know trying to be the hero and swinging out of their ass or home runs with guys on base instead of you know just trying to hit the ball the other way. And I mean, we've had more opportunities if our pitchers get a sacrifice bunt down. I mean, isn't that on the manager that none of the pitchers can bunt and we're a National League team? Isn't that ridiculous? That is ridiculous. We're a National League team, and not one of our pitchers can lay down a sack bunt. That drives me crazy. So is AJ Preller on the hot seat? I think he is. I think he's got to win in 2020 or he's gone, which is why I think you'll see prospects dealt for big leaguers. You know, hopefully they do my Boston idea with Ben and and um, Price and Myers, you know, swap mm-hmm. those bad contracts, you know, give Boston a couple prospects for Ben and you know, send some guys out to Pittsburgh for Marte, you know, put him in a corner when Trammell comes up. I mean, I think you're going to see stuff like that because Preller knows, hey, I got to win in 2020. and I can't count on all these guys. Mm hmm. Wow. So, I mean, so when you say Preller needs to win in 2020, what what do you mean? What what does he have to win? How how good does the team need to be? I'd say playing meaningful baseball in September. Okay. Otherwise, he's gone. Wow. And I mean, this scares a lot of people that you could have flat giving him flashbacks to, you know, 2014, 2015 offseason when we made all those trades, it didn't work out and then we had to start over. I don't worry about that. Like, I think something similar to that's going to happen, but I don't worry about the result going bad like it did then because we're be- we're better set up then. We got a deeper minor league system, much deeper. And look at that 2014 roster. Did we have any building blocks on that 2014 MLB roster? No. Maybe Tyson Ross, maybe? Yeah, maybe. But, yeah. I mean, look what we got now. We got Paddock. We got Tatis. We got Machado. I mean, we got, you know, Trammell's coming. Gore's coming. Patino's coming. I mean... Urias still has a chance. Mejia looks good. I mean, we're, we're in a much better spot, MLB roster and farm system-wise, than we were in 2014. And that feels weird saying because we won 77 games in 2014, only won 70 this year. But, hey, that's another reflection on Andy Green and how poor of a job I think he did. Right. Yeah. I mean, Preller gets a lot of heat for some of the bad moves. And but, he's, he, but he has made so many more good moves. I mean, he's made mistakes. There's no doubt. But I think he's done a lot more good than bad. You know, when it was interesting is when the Padres had the new ownership came in with Fowler. Yes. And I loved their process originally. They said, we're going to hire a president. Then we're going to hire, which was Mike D, which is a whole other thing. Then then there was. The, Actually, since you mentioned Mike D, I want to say this. Like yeah. some of the anti-Preller people are like, well, how can you pick Preller to trust the new manager? He picked Andy Green. I don't think he picked Andy Green. I think Mike D did because, you know, Mike D was kind of running the show. Then he wanted, you know, a yes man, you know, yeah. that he could control with the media. And then, which was stupid, because Mike D was gone the next year. Right. Like, not even 365 days after we hired Green, Mike D was gone, and we're, now we had a Mike D guy, and that was just the problem. What was your, What's your uh, theory on why he was fired? I, uh, to be honest with you, <laughs> I don't know or care. I mean, he's he was bad, he's gone now, and that's good, and I don't care beyond that. But, but I'll just say this. I, I, I thought that the approach of the ownership to say, okay, we're going to get a president— <laughs> And then we're going to get a GM, and then we're going to get a manager in that order, and we want these guys to be our guys for a long time and to have consistency and longevity and minimal disruption. But it seems like everything's just being blown up, you know? I mean, that's why Preller's on the hot seat, because, I mean, the president, that president's gone, that manager's gone. Yeah. And who's left? A.J. Preller. I mean, and if he doesn't win, you know— this next year, you know, play meaningful games in September. You know, when you see like the bottom line on ESPN, you know, last two weeks of September, like who's still in the wild card race within striking distance? You don't see the Padres on there. I mean, he's gone. I mean, because like you said, that president's gone, that manager's gone, Preller's the only one left. So it's like, hey man, you got to show something now. So 
now we're kind of we're talking about the president, which means we're getting a little bit beyond baseball itself. So what what are your thoughts on the uniforms that are coming? I'm excited for it. I mean, yeah. I mean, how many teams have blue in their color scheme? Oh, like half the teams. <laughs> and plus, we're the San Diego Padres. I mean, what colors are Friars robes? Right. Brown. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm fired up. I'm like a marketing guy. I love all the branding and just embrace the brown. This is right brown. up your alley. Yeah. Embrace the brown and, uh, you know, have a unique look. Be special in your own way. And I'll say that some of the fans' renderings of potential uniforms that I saw on Padres Twitter, those are really good. I mean, I love the idea of the pinstripe brown. With, I love- with the grays. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's a good look. I only have two requests for the uniforms. One, it's got to have, I mean, I've seen some marketing with like the Friar, you know, logo. If that's an alternate hat or a spring training hat, that's cool. But primary hat's got to have the SD, like this one I'm wearing right here. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I say this is because this is the only professional sports team in San Diego. Like, that's what they're representing. They're representing the San Diego, not only in Major League Baseball, in professional sports as a whole. So you got to have the SD on there. Yeah, I agree with that. And second of all, what was it, number two? I kind of got sidetracked. Um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I forgot. No, it's all right. It's all right. So I, I think it's going to be great. And I think they're going to announce them in November. November 9th. Oh, all right. You know the date. All right. So I'm I'm really looking forward oh, to this. And the other number two was have the San Diego on the road uniform for oh, ba- yeah. for the same reason that I said number one. That was what number two was. Agreed. Have yeah. San Diego on the road uniform. Those are both good decisions. I agree. Those are the only two requests I have. I mean... Brown and yellow, that's great. That's And that's what it looks like they're going with. Brown and yellow is great. Something similar to the current Friday Browns, perfect. I love that. You know, brown and, and yellow, brown and gold can look really good with the right design. Absolutely. But, that's... We're, but we're so tainted by those awful designs in the late <laughs> 70s and early 80s. You know? I don't think it's going to be like that. I mean, nah, that, it won't be. That's yeah. 30, 40 years ago. I mean, you got so much more information out there now, so much better technology to make better stuff like that. So any final thoughts on the Padres 2019 season? I mean, it was just, it was for most of the season, we saw what we thought was going to be a step towards next year. And I don't think September should cloud your vision about what's going on going forward for this team. And I'm looking forward to 2020. It's going to be a big off season. I think we're going to see a lot of moves, a lot of, I mean, I I say what I wanted to see happen, but what I think is going to see happen is you're going to be like, oh my God, we got that guy in a trade. We traded that guy, but we got this guy. I mean, you're going to see a lot of that this winter, well, I think. They're going to have a, a 40-man roster crunch, right? I mean, they got to package two-for-ones because they can't, they can't like, fit everybody in the 40 That's the reason why I think you can see some of these major leaguers traded because it's like maybe like they'd rather give up a major leaguer and two prospects instead of three prospects or something like that. I mean, and get major leaguers, that helps with a 40-man crunch. So that's right. another reason why I think you could see major leaguers traded. All right, so um, let's talk a little, switch it up a bit. I like your shirt. Thank you. Yeah, so fight for San Diego. The Aztecs are tonight, right? Yes, 7 o'clock, ESPN2. All right, and they're playing, what, the Rams, Colorado, Colorado State? State? Yes. So let's talk about that. We, we had the Aztec preview show, and you've been pretty much on target, right? Yeah, I unfortunately correctly predicted the Utah State loss. Yeah. I predicted, you know, a 10-point win over UCLA, and we won by nine, although we could have won that game by way more. Mm -hmm. Um, I predicted a tough one against Weber State. I predicted a fairly easy one against New Mexico State. Yeah, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but first four games, gone pretty much like I thought. Right on. Okay, so today's game, I mean, it's got to be a big Aztec uh, advantage in this game, right? Yeah, I mean, Colorado State lost their QB a couple weeks ago. He blew out his knee, and, you know, their defense sucks. I mean, and they, I don't know, they're one of the worst run defenses in college football. So I don't know if Jordan Washington's ankle is still acting up or if he's going to play. But, I mean, even if he's out, you know, Jordan Bird, Chance Bell, Chase Jasmine should have a big game against that Rams defense tonight. So the game's on the road, right? Yes, at Fort Collins. Okay, so looking forward to that. That's at 7 o'clock. Yeah. Um, I know this podcast, you know, we're recording it. What time is it now? It's probably around 3 o'clock or so. Yeah. And I'm going to try to get this posted tonight. All right. Um, so, um, you know, maybe that'll be up sometime during the Aztec game if All I right. can make, I make it work. Um, hey, what, what about the MLB playoffs? What are your thoughts on that this year? Um, I don't think anybody's going to beat the Astros. I mean, the Yankees have a chance, mm-hmm. but I think the real World Series for the Astros is can they get past the Yankees in the ALCS? Because I don't see Tampa Bay having any chance against Houston. I don't see Minnesota having much of a chance. I mean, when we started recording this, it was one nothing Yankees in the first, and the Yankees won last night. So 
Mm-hmm. I just think the biggest obstacle for the Astros is the Yankees in the ALCS right. to the World Series. And what about in the NL? What do you see? I mean, I don't see the Dodgers going to the World Series for a third year in a row. So who would it be? I mean, Washington's got a real good shot against them. I mean, Washington split the first two in L.A. I mean, they're going to pitch Scherzer game three. I mean, and they can clinch at home game four. And, I mean, that Washington's been the best team in baseball since May 24th, so. Really? Yeah. They really have been. I mean, and, they probably and, would have beat out Atlanta for the NL East if they didn't get off of that terrible start. That's a damn good baseball team. Yeah, who needs Bryce Harper, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing about the Nationals is that all season long, the Dodgers were bailed out. Like, whenever Jansen would blow a save, they'd walk it off in the bottom half. Or if they were on the road, they'd f- win in extra innings. All season long, they were just able to bail Jansen out when he blew a save. That's not going to fly in the playoffs against these good teams. I'll tell you what, Strasburg was awesome in Game 2. Uh, That's lo- another thing. If, yeah. If it gets to a game five in L.A., I mean, they're going to have Strasburg against Kershaw, and that's what Washington won with last night. Right, exactly. So you see maybe the Nationals over the Dodgers, uh, potentially, and then Braves and uh, Cardinals. What do you see there? I thought St. Louis, it was huge for them to win game one because I figured, okay, they got Flaherty game two. Now they can win game two and go home up two and nothing. But now Atlanta, I think, took the advantage back because they got Soroka game three. Tomorrow in St. Louis. And then if St. Louis wins game four at home, game five is back in Atlanta. So I think winning game two was huge for Atlanta. I think that swung the whole series. Because I thought the series was majorly in favor of St. Louis after they came back to win game one. But I think Atlanta kind of took the edge back by winning game two. So you just said Soroka. That's another rookie of the year candidate, right? Yes. So who do you like, him or, or uh, the Mets first baseman? Oh, Alonzo's going to win. I mean, yeah. they're not going to they're it's they're not going to snub a New York guy who hit 53 home runs. There's just no way. No way. So so um so what do, what do you see as the uh, NL Championship Series outcome and the AL Championship Series? I mean, at this point I think Washington's going to beat the Dodgers now at this yeah. point and then Washington will beat, you know, Atlanta, and then Washington will lose to Houston in the World Series. So a wild card team making it all the way to the the World Series. Yeah, I mean, we're no stranger to that. I mean, we saw in 2014, it was two wild card teams playing Mm -hmm. each other in the World Series, which Mm -hmm. was kind of crazy. But, yeah, you know, I mean, and then you saw the Cardinals won the World Series as a wild card 2011. Mm -hmm. And then um, Tampa Bay wasn't a wild card. Um, Colorado was 07. Right. And then Boston, you know, broke the curse in 04 as a wild card. Was it was Colorado 07 when Holiday didn't touch the plate? Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that he didn't touch the plate because he didn't. Yeah. Uh, that's still bitter. That was 12 years ago. Um, that was one of the worst sports losses I've ever had. Uh, and I'm still not. I'm still mad about it 12 years later. Yeah. Well, you should be. And you're a hometown San Diego guy, which I love. Um, all right. Well, let, we're wrapping it up here. I mean, any other final closing thoughts here? I mean... Hold on to your seatbelts, ladies and gentlemen. This offseason is going to be fun. I'll just say that. Yeah, and really, they can't really sign a manager or make deals until after the World Series, right? Actually, that's not correct. They just MLB doesn't want it to undermine so like the World Series or playoffs. So like they'd hire him. I don't know, like in between like the LCS and the World Series, or in between days in the World Series. Like they announced the Andy Green hiring um, in, on the travel day between games. Two and three in 2015. Okay. Um, but the trades won't be until after, right? No, the trades. I mean, because you still got teams in the playoffs. So right. you got that That obviously has to wait until um, after so, the World Series. So that might be like winter meetings, maybe early December. We might yeah. start to see a little movement. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Okay. I'd say so. All right. Well, David, thanks, man. This is always great. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love having you. You're my go-to guy for sports, especially San Diego sports. Um, looking forward to watching the MLB playoffs. The Aztecs tonight, ESPN2, 7 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And let's uh, hope the Aztecs can uh, get another W. Yeah, I mean, Colorado State's. this is a game we got to have. I mean, because we got Hawaii, Fresno State. We got other games that we could lose coming later on in the year. So we got to take care of these ones tonight if we want to win the division. And, you know, I mean, Central Florida has two losses. I mean... The group of five bid for a New Year's Six Bowl is wide open now. So really, if we went out and, you know, that would include being Boise State in the Mountain West Championship game, probably. So that if we went out and then beat Boise State in the Mountain West Championship game, I mean, who knows? We could be in the New Year's Six. That would be sweet. That would be sweet for anything. I've said this on the first time I was on here, like this city needs something anything to celebrate <laughs> i know really even like the aztecs like sneaking into a new year's six as a group of five team would just be 
so awesome. This city needs anything in sports. Anything. Yeah. So let's go get something. I mean, know? when the MLB playoffs ends in a couple of weeks, I mean, you won't even, you won't see a league that has San Diego associated with it professionally until spring training starts. Pretty much. Yeah. Exactly. Like and, we are like have because what Dean Spanos and Roger Goodell did to us, they didn't just take our NFL team. They took us with the way the Padres have been honestly irrelevant since they last made the playoffs, or since 2007 anyways, we've kind of fallen as a city off the sports map. I mean, and it's really unfortunate. It is. We got to get back to that. I mean, and that's why I think this offseason is huge for the Padres. Yeah. So th- this will be a good, uh, yeah, the good off season, And then the Aztecs are in the middle of their football season. Aztec basketball is going to be starting soon. Yeah. Um, and then once we get into 2020, my alma mater, UCSD, is going to be D1. Right on. So I'm looking forward to that, too. So all good stuff. David, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. All right, we'll see you. All right.